in this room can uh, really relate to that and to that experience, even all these years later. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if I ever introduced my own husband before, but I guess it was the first time for everything. Um, as we were driving over here, it occurred to me, it used to be, especially shortly after my father's arrest, as I was traveling the country, kind of um, speaking about this case, I always used to look at life as, um, you know, two different periods before he was arrested and after. And obviously how drastically things changed after. And um, I realized today that I've actually been married to my husband um, for nearly as long as, um, or maybe even longer, the number of years than um, it was after my dad's arrest and before I met him. And we were just talking about how getting older and the passage of time really sort of warps your own um, perception of time. But uh, I think joining our family, he's really um, understood and, and has, able, has been able to learn uh, firsthand what it's like to go through an experience like this. And um, we wanted him to come tonight to speak from the perspective of a Muslim scholar and to give some words about um, the concept of justice in Islam and the importance of um, speaking out and defending those who've been unjustly accused. Um, Jonathan Brown is the Walid bin Talal Chair of Islamic Civilization in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, and he's the director of the Center for Muslim Christian Understanding. He received his BA in History from Georgetown in 2000 and his doctorate in Near Eastern Language and Civilizations from the University of Chicago in 2006. His most recent book, Misquoting Muhammad, The Challenges and Choices of Interpreting the Prophet's Legacy, was named one of the top books on religion in 2014 by the Independent. Courageous, and that's just complete you know, horseradish. I remember one of the first discussions I had with Bailey's dad, it was about, you know, I was saying Ronald Reagan was the greatest president. <laughs> he was uh, not, he didn't agree with me on that. Um, I think we were already married, otherwise, maybe he wouldn't have uh, agreed to marry her. Um, but my point is that, uh, you know, uh, if you told me, um, well, let's say when we got married in 2010, if you told me in 2010, all the stuff that you've heard today, uh, I just wouldn't have believed you. I would say, no, no, this is the United States. That's like other, you know, that like, you know, Saudi consulate, whatever, other countries, they do this stuff. It doesn't happen here. No, it doesn't happen. This stuff doesn't happen here. Um, and when you realize it does happen here, it really, it really pisses people off. I mean, it really, um, very quickly, out of these people when they really get what's happening, right? When you really make them understand. Um, it doesn't take long for someone to start seeing things differently. And uh, a lot of times when I whenever I read these testimonies or think about a lot of you know my, my family, I, I usually just feel a lot of shame because when I remember when Bailey's dad was arrested, I don't know if I I think I've told you this before, but if not, it'll be an interesting evening. Uh, the, you know, I, when um, he, he was arrested, one of my friends, another Muslim guy, he's in law school, and he, uh, we were talking about the case. And um, this is long before I knew it, but um, he said, that, oh, I read the charges, he's definitely guilty. You know? And uh, it wasn't until I talked to his dad and understood how the government works that the stuff they say you did when they announced your indictment is not even they think you did that. They know they can't. Stuff. They'll say, oh, he you know, ate five babies and punched ten 
homeless people and killed 50 puppies and did all this stuff. And they know it's not true, it doesn't matter. They just later they just supersede another indictment. But they just put this out there in the media and what people do, they just accept it. I just accept it. My lawyer friend just accepted it. And uh, when I realize how this works, it's actually really liberating because I just don't believe anything the government says about people at all. And by the way, that's your constitutional common law obligation as well to get this their obligation to prove someone's guilty, not your obligation to believe the government when they say something about something. Right? Um, so, uh, I actually um, am optimistic, very optimistic, because, uh, you know, until, when was the Ferguson thing, like 2014? Until, this is really embarrassing, until, if you told me in 2014 like, that the police in America just shoot black, young black men for no reason, I was like, that's not true, it's ridiculous. No, I'm sure they did something wrong, but obviously a criminal or something. I mean, you would just shoot somebody for no reason. That, that doesn't happen in this country, it happens in other countries. <coughs> And I think it was maybe after like the 20th video or whatever that happened, I realized actually this does happen, right? And um, mind you, I'm Muslim. I've been Muslim for over 20 years or something. And family, you know, my family is Layla's family. So I, I know about, it's not like I'm unaware of this stuff. But I didn't understand what happened to young black men until I saw God knows how many of these videos. Now, the reason why it makes me optimistic is because all you need to do is to have people be skeptical of their government. Which is, by the way, exactly what Americans are supposed to do. I mean, we don't have to read much about the American Revolution, the Constitution, everything, to realize that, you know, questioning the, the right of others to hold authority over us and to have their, the government have their way with us is, uh, a, a, you know, part of American political rights. So we, you know, a lot of times, I think this one scholar, Aaron Kanani, he wrote, you know, that the, the war on American, on, on Muslim civil liberties, not on civil liberties, the war on Muslim civil liberties in America was started by George W. Bush. It was made legal by Barack Obama, but I'm actually very optimistic that it's going to sort of uh, peak and then start to, on its downslope under Donald Trump. Because, you know, when you were doing, during the Obama years, God knows what it was like during the Bush time, during Obama years, you know, we, I always felt really stressed out about my father-in-law, Layla's name, um, the fact that there's all these FBI cars sitting outside our house all the time, <laughs> running their stupid engines constantly, um, like me shuffling snow or mowing the lawn uh, next to them. But uh, I always felt this was, oh, I felt ashamed by this, and and uh, now, like, this is just uh, kind of gives me street cred. You know, I mean, this is the kind of stuff. This is like the the currency of of resistance in Trump's America. I mean, now people believe you when you say uh, somebody got killed for no reason. You, people believe you when you say this person was targeted by unfair government policies. People go to the airport when they hear about this Muslim ban, right? Um, this is a big difference, and I mean, it's sort of unfortunate that it has to happen because our president's like a, you know, xenophobic ass. But I mean, and, you know, that's a, one of the upsides of this is that anybody who doesn't like the Trump administration is very happy now to listen to Muslims in a way that they wouldn't have before. So, you know, now is the time that we really need to to try and communicate to all the other Jonathan Browns out there, and Jonathan Ed, what the female version of me, whatever, you know, communicate to them, uh, you communicate to them uh, what we have to say, what someone like me has learned, about how uh, the time, it's time now to really try and maybe turn back the clock, or to dial back a lot of these measures and to release some of these people from the insanely unfair and unjust and totally baseless sentences that they've received. Does that come okay.
So I just introduced my husband, and now I'm going to introduce my brother from another mother, Ahmed Bidet. Ahmed Bidet has worked for the past decade as a community organizer, radio show host, human rights advocate, television commentator, and interfaith leader. Bidet is the founder of United Voices of America, president of the Human Rights Council of Tampa Bay, and serves on the state board of the ACLU of Florida. His organization offers programs and training to enable and facilitate minority participation in all aspects of government and the political process. And he's a friend of CCF. He was here last year. He gave a great um, presentation. He'll be giving a presentation tomorrow as well. So let's uh, help me welcome him and also thank him for his commitment to CCF. Thank you, Layla. Let's give Layla a big round of applause. <laughs> and the award-winning Layla. Congratulations again. And apparently tomorrow she's getting another award, the Excellence in Media Award at the uh, Care Bank Club. So, um, you know, I came to this conference, this is my third time attending this conference. Uh, I did come last year and, you know, I gave a presentation. And every time I come, um, you know, and on one hand, it's sad to hear the stories. You know, we shouldn't have this conference. If we lived in a perfect world, there wouldn't be a need for CCF. There wouldn't be a need for the support group. There wouldn't be a need for the families of the forgotten. But the reality is we live in America. And America does have this history of mistreating different segments of their populations at different times. It's happened to people before us, and it's happening to us you know, now. And for the most part, it's been people of color. So there's a stain on our American history. When people talk about American ex exceptionalism, they neglect to mention all the atrocities of how America treated its most vulnerable people. And we continue when we see the racial disparities and uh, racial inequalities and uh, uh, issues dealing um, with racial injustice. It's a, you know, what we inherited from our past of slavery and just mistreating non-whites. You know, and I know it's been mentioned that we live in a challenging time under President Trump, but it's also been mentioned it's a time of opportunity. We heard about the Muslim ban and how all these people flocked to the airports. Had that Muslim ban happened under Obama, people would not be going to the airports. The people didn't have a, a change of heart about Muslims, the people had a change of heart about Trump. <laughs> so they're, they're anti-Trump more than pro-Muslim. They're not Muslim-loving white liberals. They're just Trump-hating white liberals. <laughs> and so the reality is our condition and the issues and the cause that we're advocating for is not going to change based on who's in the White House. It's not going to change because of Trump or Obama or Hillary or even Bernie Sanders, who I admire. And I was a delegate for at the Democratic National Convention. But even if he was in office, things would not change for our community. Why? Because people will never change our condition, just like the Quran says. And I'm not the scholar, you know, Jonathan Brown is, and he didn't mention the scholarship. But just this part about that God promises in the Quran, it's like a, a law in our faith that says God will never change the condition of a people until they change themselves. The reality that we're living today is not, it, you know, a lot of it has to do because of our own community. Things have not changed for the black community because white people decided, hey, we're just being mean to you, and let's just give you your rights, right? They had to go fight for their rights. They had to demand their rights. And sure, some white people joined, but they had to start it. Nobody did it for them. They had to have leaders like Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and the Black Panthers and others. Some of them were more radical than others. But a combination of that brought some progress. But even despite all of that, you can still see the injustice that's happening today, where black people are getting murdered on the streets. 
by police officers. You're not talking about, you know, by the KKK. Some of these people that used to be in the KKK just put on police uniforms and started using their badges to kill black people, but they're still accomplishing the same thing. Not to say and generalize that all police officers are bad, but there are definitely a lot of racists that are joining these police forces so they can legalize their killings and brutality against black people. And we're seeing it. We're seeing it not because we have cameras, we have phones. It's being documented. It's always been happening. We just didn't believe it. People in America and white liberals are not getting serious about gun violence because gun violence didn't exist before, but now because white kids are getting killed, so they're getting serious about it. When it starts impacting their own selves is when they start waking up, and because it's happening to Muslims, they don't care. But what's even worse is when Muslims don't care themselves. So when we talk about forgotten, it's not because of the main major society, the majority, and the white people just forgot about these families and these people in cages. It's because the Muslims themselves have forgotten about them, and if the Muslims don't care about these families and these cases, then how do we ex expect the rest of society to care? And for law enforcement, for the FBI, we're sitting ducks. We're, we're easy scapegoats. You can go after these people and they won't fight back. They'll just cave in. We'll put so many resources against them, they don't have the money and they have to cut a plea. And when they cut a plea, they win. And they turn a normal case of whether it's whatever it may be, they add terrorism enhancements and all of a sudden they have another terrorism case that they scored. So they can justify their big budgets when they go in front of Congress and say, look at the hundreds of terrorism cases and terrorists that we, stop, we, you know, we stopped. Without mentioning, of course, that half of them were fabricated or more than half of them were fabricated by them in made-for-TV type scenarios like we saw in Albany and we see in the Brooklyn, in Miami, all over this country, vulnerable individuals, many of them have mental illnesses or weak people are getting entrapped left and right with fake plots. And when they find vulnerable people, instead of bringing them back to sanity, they push them over the edge to become insane. Where they put them under scrutiny and they monitor them around the clock and they know their vulnerabilities, they're spying on them. They know where their weaknesses are. They know where they're hurting and all of a sudden the informant that shows up has a, the, the solution to all their problems. Whether it's a money issue, whether it's a family member that's sick, whether it's this or that, maybe it's a drug issue and they start giving them the drugs. Or they give them what they need and all of a sudden they gain their trust. And at that point some of these people like the Liberty 7 in Miami were giving allegiances, allegiances to Al-Qaeda for $50,000 each when none of them were Muslim. One of the lawyers told me that when she went to see them and said, you know, do you want us to make a comment? How are they taking care of your religious accommodations in here? Can we get you a Quran, a prayer rug? And he's like, Quran? You know, I'm Christian. He's like, what? They just call you a jihadi that you're loyal to Al-Qaeda. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that to get the $50,000. And for some of these people that were in the inner city in the Liberty 7 situation, they were just trying to clean up their hood. They thought there was a lot of gangs and they had to kind of be militant and radical and just, you know, kind of like protect the neighborhood kind of people. And these people preyed on them. And they ended up, in the first time they were, you know, uh, they couldn't convict them and they had a second shot and they convicted them. But when we look at these cases, and as soon as somebody's arrested in the Muslim community and the Muslim community runs as the first to run, that's the problem. When you go to these cases and the courtroom is empty and there are no Muslims there watching, the judge could do whatever they want. Well, these, these people don't have anyone backing them up, so why should I care? Nobody's watching me. Earlier this year, or uh, last year, I got a phone call from um, a, um, an attorney that says I have a client that has a big trial coming up. There's a lot of misinformation about the case in the local media and around the country. And we need some help to, um, to dispel some of this misinformation because the FBI has been lying and leaking information that's false to incriminate our client. And who's the client? It was the wife of the Orlando shooter. One of the worst mass killings in American history on a gay nightclub in Orlando. We heard about it, the Pulse nightclub. And I live in Florida. Of course, when I got this phone call, of course, there was some reluctance. 
you know, I don't want to be associated with this case. You know, who's going to go and try to get involved in this? Well, I, even if I believe she's innocent, obviously there are consequences to stepping up and putting your neck out there. And I don't know this person. I don't know this woman. Uh, but the more I learned about it, the more I you know, discovered that they you know, did her wrong. And of course, the lawyers and CCF you know, appealed to my emotions because you know, they're good at that. And, and my values and principles. And I did get involved in it to try to change some of the narrative that was happening locally because we've heard all these things. We heard that the guy was gay. We heard that he was having, you know, he had frequented this nightclub. We heard that they had gone there together, him and his wife, to scope out the club before they did this mass shooting. That he wanted to punish these people for being gay, you know, uh, for ISIS and other things. All of these things turned out to be false, but they weren't being reported in the media because the only side that was leaking information was the FBI. The family didn't have any way to leak anything. And the family was just one woman. But what she did and what her defense team did is a textbook example of what we should all do when the government comes after us. One, don't cave in and don't admit guilt when you did nothing wrong. And that was the first step. And second, make sure you have a good legal team. You don't accept these public defenders. Many of them are good, but they don't have the resources, or they don't have the expertise. Because, you know, in the American justice system is not uh, equality. It's not just a fair fight. The American justice system is like two boxers in a boxing ring with a referee. The judge is a referee. So would you go up into a fight against Habib? Or, you know, McGregor, O'Connor, O'Connor, McGregor. You know, you don't have the skills and you just never even went in the courtroom before. You have to have the best fighter that can go head-to-head -head with the prosecutors. And for that, you're, gonna have to, you're not going to get these guys for cheap. Right? If you, want, if you want to go against the government, you have to have, like, the King James or LeBron James on your courts. Somebody that can dunk on them every day and at the end defeat them because the judge is not going to break and say, hey, wait a minute, guys, you prosecute, you're playing dirty, right? They'll get away with it as long as the other side can check them. So in this situation, the prosecutors were playing really dirty. And they had a confession. Fortunately, it was a confession that made, was made to the FBI and not to the Saudis. <laughs> because the confession made to the FBI, there's some, you know, you can at least have a chance to to fight back. As unfortunately we learned with the Jamal, the Saudis play by different rules. And sadly, it's a shame that these Saudis call themselves Muslim. If I had a, you know, a situation where I'd want to be on trial, I would choose this in America, in Trump's America, a thousand times before I ever trust, you know, Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia. I don't care if he's a custodian or they're the custodians of the Holy Mosque, no way. And that's the reality that we live in now. Just because somebody has a Muslim label does not mean you're going to be safe. So back to Noor Salman. They had a confession. She wrote a confession within hours of the murder of these people that she assisted her husband in, you know, this plan to kill these people. And they took months after it, and, and, and the thing that struck me was, this, even though she gave this confession, they let her walk free. Okay, she just admitted that she was uh, you know, an accomplice in this crime. Why would you let her go? And they let her go for seven months. In fact, they allowed her to move from Florida to California. Now, that's suspicious. It wasn't until in the final days of the Obama administration, two days before the inauguration of Trump, that they arrest her. And they put her in solitary confinement for months and charged her with being aiding and abetting basically the exact same crime as if she shot all those people. What we found out later is that the FBI had lied. That the, hand, the handwritten confession was written by, in the hands of the FBI agent, that she was never given any you know, rights to the lawyer, and in fact it was after you know, a, a lot of pressure. And the FBI found out within days of that confession, that half the confession was false based on forensic evidence. For example, in the confession, she said she and her husband drove by the nightclub. Well, the forensic evidence of the cell phones, because the cell phones, you have the cell phone data, which they pulled all the cell phone data, 
they didn't put her anywhere near the nightclub ever. In fact, neither of them have ever been near that nightclub ever before. What well, we found out in trial that he didn't even know the Pulse nightclub ever existed. That he shows the Pulse nightclub minutes before he showed up and started shooting people, and it was his third target that night. After the first two targets that he went to, he failed to get in because they had heavy security, where the Pulse nightclub had almost no security, so it was easy for him to get in. How do we know that? Because of his GPS and the commands he put on his cell phone. In his cell phone, when he first tried to go to Disney and tried to do the shooting there, the Disney cameras show this guy going around and trying to get in. And there's heavy police presence, so he left. He waited around Disney for a couple of hours, eventually left. What did he do when he went back to his car in the parking lot of Disney? He, he Googled downtown nightclubs. He didn't Google Pulse nightclub. He didn't Google gay nightclubs. He Googled downtown nightclubs. The first one that came up was Club Eve, which is in downtown Orlando. We drove by Club Eve. A lot of people there. It was packed, but there's a lot of police outside. He couldn't walk in with his weapons. So he again went back to his car and Googled nightclubs again. The second option on there was Pulse nightclub. He tried to, he started driving towards Pulse. The GPS shows you exactly where he goes. They showed this all in trial. But in order to defend yourself, you have to have the team and the money to be able to hire these experts to be able to, you know, do the forensic evidence on the phones. If you don't have the money, you can't do it. You can't prove your innocence. He went by the, by club, by the, night, the, the Pulse nightclub, and guess what? He had a change of heart. He started going back to Club Eve. Then he Googled again for directions to Pulse. He went back to Pulse. He parked on the side, walked in with all his weapons. The guy at the door asked, he asked the guy at the door to show you as proof that he did not know that this is a gay club. He asked the guy at the, at the door, where are all the girls? Where are all the girls? This guy was not gay. They showed that his, what is that website called? Plenty of Fish website account. He was only having sex with women, even though he was married. So there was no gay activity, but they wanted to just put this out there that this guy was some, so, somehow conflicted gay person. Why at the end what we discovered was, and this was a bombshell in the trial, that his father had been an informant for the FBI for like the past 15 years. His own father was on the FBI payroll for so many years. We know this because the FBI agent that was handling his father took the stand and testified to that. And he even went further to say, when I interviewed the young man, because he got in trouble with the law before, and the father intervened and got him out of trouble. In fact, on the second interview, the father showed up at the interview. And he was harassing the FBI, why are you going after my son? And they asked the guy, why did you meet with him, Omar Mateen, a third time? He said, because I wanted to develop Omar Mateen as an informant for the FBI. This FBI agent on the stand testified that he wanted to recruit this mass shooter as an FBI informant for the FBI. So who failed here? It wasn't more said, man, it was the FBI. They failed to protect the Orlando community. They failed to protect these gay people. Had they followed the signs when this person had made threats in the past and not get him off the hook because his own father was informant for them, then those people may be alive today. They're the ones that are at fault. And they should be held accountable. And people should get fired. And for lying and creating a missing so many things, but nobody got in trouble for it. But what did happen is the jury in the Middle District of Florida saw through their lies and said that she was not guilty. And today, because the stand that she took, Norsa Men is free. <laughs> we say this because it's important that one, you don't give in. And two, you have to rally support. And make sure that your friends, Muslim and others, are there. And you challenge the government narrative. And you, we, we're not going to be afraid of them. In America, we still have some rights. They're counting on our fear. They're counting that we're not going to show up. And I remember just going to trial. And the first couple of days, I was the only Muslim there. And Mel Underbaki. Mel, are you Muslim? No, you're not Muslim. I have a question about you. I think you might be in the closet Muslim. She's hanging out with Muslims all the time. <laughs> Ashley, we're not sure about you either. <laughs> We'll take the shahada after this, okay? <laughs>
But, you know, God bless her. Mel was there holding the sign that's outside, fair trial, just like she was outside for the Samuel Ariane case. And with all these terrorism trials, I think there was like, since 9-11, there's been like three or four wins. Two of them, or three of, three of them, came from the Middle District of Florida where I live. So if you want to get in trouble, get on trial, go to the Middle District of Florida. Let's give our district a round of applause. Defeated the government narrative three times. But a lot of it is based on the community relations we have built with people who are not just Muslim, but people on the, uh, who are also from the other faith community that are standing up. We had, we went and visited church leaders. We went and even visited the gay community. We went to the big, and they were uncomfortable with our conversation when we started to say things like, he was not targeting gay people. That was difficult for some of them to hear. Because for months, there was so much emphasis on what happened, the attack on the biggest attack on gays in America. And many of them didn't like, they shut the door in our face, some of them. But when the stuff started coming out, they knew we were telling the truth. We went and visited faith leaders in the community, and they wrote some op-eds to say, you know what, let's not rush to judgment. So you have to mobilize. If you're going up against the most powerful government in the world, and they're going after you, you can't just sit idle and make du'a. you got to work hard and then go make du'a. So we have to show up, we have to make sure that the rest of the community is not afraid. The narrative and things will change when we empower ourselves, one in the courts and politically. When we have strong political relations, we should demand from our senators to ask the hard questions of the FBI. Why are you continuing to do these things? They may not listen to us, but they care about our budget, their budgets from members of Congress. Just like we're gonna go on Monday and talk to members of Congress, that's very important. And you don't let them off, and you keep going back and telling your stories to these people. You get their business cards, and you build relationships with them. Let them internalize and understand where you're coming from. And then things will start changing. So, um, let's work together to make sure this happens. Have a great weekend. You're going to learn a lot. And uh, let's push back against these uh, politics of fear and the scapegoating and the persecution that's happening within the community. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Ahmed. I think it was really important to hear about the Nur Salman case and to hear what can happen when a community mobilizes, not just, as Ahmed mentioned, by raising money and making sure that Nur Salman had good lawyers, but also having a media campaign, which was led by CCF and especially Nina, Having um, a community campaign, community activism, Ahmed and Mel, what they did, showing up and really being present. So all of that I think was really instructive for us as an audience. Please join me in thanking all of the speakers once again. Everyone. Please.